No, oh, yeah. All right, law of contracts, unit one, everyone. Our learning objectives for the evening. And we'll be describing the composition and duties of the Texas Real Estate Commission, TREC. Uh, describe the unauthorized practice of law and how to avoid it. We'll describe the composition and duties of the Broker Lawyer Committee. We'll describe TREC's rules regarding the use of promulgated forms. We'll explain and give examples of the exceptions to TREC's rules regarding the use of promulgated forms. Slow down a little bit more. Slow down. Just a little more. Slow down. Yeah, slow down. Not so fast. Uh, we'll describe the requirement by Section 5.008 of the Texas Property Code for sailors to provide to buyers a written notice of a property's condition. Uh, we'll identify the exceptions to the seller's disclosure requirement. We'll explain when the seller has to provide the seller's disclosure. We'll describe the buyer's rights based upon the receipt of the disclosure. And we'll describe how the Deceptive Trade Practice, Practices Act applies to real estate agents. All right, Texas Real Estate License Act, otherwise abbreviated TRALA. It's administered by Texas Real Estate Commission, and it basically sets rules regarding contracts. Um, they basically give information on regulating the real estate field. Um, and TRELA, TRELA here, and TREC, that's how it will appear on your test. They won't say the Texas Licensing Act, they'll say TRELA and TREC. And there's all kinds of other abbreviations, so just know what they are and what they mean. It'll be good. So we have to know what TRAILA stands for? Right, right. You will need to know what uh, each of the abbreviations uh, stand for. So I've got a question. Okay. Um, what exactly is TRAILA? What, what, is, what is that? It was an act passed. What does um, it do? It regulates the real estate field. Okay. And so why does TRAIC and TRAILA, why do those go hand in hand? Uh, TRAILA is actually what created TREC. Okay. So TRAIL is the law that was the legislators put into practice or put into play right. that then created this committee called TREC. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. Dave, you're going to say something? Uh, yeah. I mean, don't get too stopped up on TRAIL and TREC. You're going to hear them thousands of times. No, so that's the next couple of months. So yeah, you'll know exactly what they mean once we say TREC and TRAIL. I don't have no, no worries about that. <clears throat> All right. The unauthorized practice of law. Okay, you see the present button? The top right. Hit that button. I guess we did these ones out. Yes, we are. You're not hitting the other ones on that one. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the unauthorized practice of law. This is actually a federal offense, and it's prohibited by TRAILA. Uh, it can cause the suspension or revocation of a license and in the Realtor Code of Ethics. Licensees may give factual statements and business details and explain the forms, but they may not give legal advice. Um, as a real estate agent, you can draft documents and you can explain documents, but you can't actually um, create the document, create like a, a contract. Like a template. Right. Because okay. uh, trick is it? Well, we're going into that a little later. How about, how about you go ahead and show them? Let Aiden pull that one up because she has a good question. Show, show her real quick and show them all what the form looks like in regards to what you fill out on a daily basis, what we deal with. Are you doing a one-four payment? Uh-huh. Oh, I was going to go into that later. I know, but let's go on and pull it up so they get familiarized with it. There you go. So yeah. that form that you see right there. 90% of your transactions will be on this form. That is correct. So there's that's the reason that you don't need to draft one. Yeah. But some people think that they have to draft their own forms. Can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's unauthorized practice. So Wyatt, say that you went out mm -hmm. and you talked to Miss Davenport, and Miss Davenport says, "Hey, draft me up a contract." That's for a lawyer. 
Your job is only to fill in the blanks. Right. Does that make sense? Does. Okay. So if Miss Davenport wants one that has to be drafted or whatever, they, then she would have to hire an attorney. I'm going to shut this yeah. blind because it's nice and effective. And can you go back to the slide? Um, when you get licensed, you will become a real estate agent, but you're not an actual realtor until you join uh, NAR and TAR, and that's the National Association of Realtors and the Texas Association of Realtors. And once you join both of those, then you will be considered a realtor. But if you didn't join those, you can't use that name. You have to be just a real estate agent. Um, and how much does that cost to use that word realtor here? <laughs> well, I, it's, it's not exactly cheap, but it's not too bad. Uh, how much did it charge you, Mr. Aiden, for your first year? You got your real estate license and, and you just got it and you went down, Justin took you down to the local MLS office and how much did you have to pay? You remember? It's like almost seven. How much? $7? No, seven dollars? No, seven dollars. Seven dollars. You only paid seven dollars? How much? I think I paid thirteen hundred. Okay, I, it was either twelve. I think it was either twelve. Look at those looks. Yeah, she's like, no, not thirteen hundred. So, so when you join, no, that, that sounds better. <laughs> when you join, it does cost about. It, so, say y'all all join January first. Everybody join January first. It's gonna be about fifteen hundred bucks total for both. For for everything, so your realtor, your MLS, your super key, everything. That's about, that's about what I paid. Yeah. It's about fifteen hundred. Now, it's prorated every year, and so it's pro or not every every month. It's prorated. So if you end up you join say in July, only six hundred bucks. Okay, so you're paying for the year. You're paying so the year. Now, when January comes back around, you have to pay. Well, no, once you pay your six hundred, say you paid six hundred. When January comes back around, you only have to pay five hundred. Yeah, but your MLS dues are prorated. Do you see how that works? So you'll pay up front. The reason it's so expensive in the beginning is because you have to pay all of the like one-time fees, like the application fee, the application fee, all these fees. But then that's gone after that one time. So then it just goes from there. It just turns around, and it just basically you just pay five hundred dollar fee yearly to just use that realtor code. But you can apply any time of the year. Mm -hmm. And every month it goes down. Now I'm going to tell you something. Don't ever join on the last day of the month. That's what I always tell mine. Because they do it monthly. So if you join on the 1st or the 31st, you still have to pay that full month, even though you didn't have access for that full month. That's what I always tell people. If they come to me like the last week of the month, I'm like, I'm not going to sponsor you until that last week passes. Once that last week passes, then I'll sponsor you that next month because I'm not going to hit you back with all those those fees. So I just wait you out until that first and then sponsor you. You see kind of how that works? Yeah. Good. Good Fifteen hundred is a lot, but if you think about it, you make one sale and you yeah, pay that back and then some. So. Because and I'll, it just burn this into your memory. Everybody that's listening, burn this in your memory. Every hundred thousand is approximately three thousand in commission. If you keep that in your mind, and right now our values are running close to three hundred thousand dollars as our average. So that's nine thousand dollars in commission. Is that like what you get to take home, or is that? That's what you'll split with your broker. Okay. So that's like the gross. And then you got to split with your the firm that you're with. Okay. If that makes sense. And average homes are like two fifty to three hundred now. Yep. And then you pay taxes from your split. You'll pay your taxes, and the broker has to pay their taxes. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. And we'll talk a lot more about that throughout the program. A ton. Nice. All right. Any any other questions? Anybody ask your online what? people? You what? Did you repeat? You said you uh, if you do your real estate, uh, you you have your real estate license, right? But you're not real until right. So you, 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 when you pass the test you, and you get sponsored by um, like a broker, okay. um, you'll be considered a real estate agent. You can still work in the field and all that, but you can't use the word realtor to describe yourself or your job okay. and, um, until you join NAR and TAR. So real quick, Wyatt, on that too, say, say you join Miss Davenport, she's a broker. 
but she's not part of any MLSs or anything. Mm -hmm. You'll be, you and Miss Davenport are real estate. She's a real estate broker. You're a real estate agent. But if she, say you came to me and I'm part of the MLS, you have to join because I'm part of it. So if the broker is part of the MLS, you have to join with that broker and that MLS. So you can't be a secondary, just an agent. I can't hold you as an agent, but then hold Aiden as a realtor. I have to hold all of them either as a realtor or all of them as an agent, but I can't have them separate. Right. Does right. that make sense? Gotcha. Okay. All right. Any other questions on this slide? Uh, and Unauthorized practice of law. Sometimes you might see it written as UPL, another abbreviation. They love doing that. I don't know why. <laughs> they love the. They love to use just acronyms. Yeah, right? Acronyms and yes. abbreviations. Yes. All that yes. Stuff. Okay, the broker lawyer committee. Now we said that uh, Trela. Sorry. Trela created Trek, right? You already went to take that. Yeah. Trela created Trek. And Shrek created the Broker Loyal Committee. And the Broker Loyal Committee, they draft forms and edit forms, and then Shrek will approve those forms. So the, the Broker Loyal Committee is the one that actually drafts and edits. But they then, they then have to be approved by Shrek, and then they become a promulgated form. Wyatt, do you know what promulgated means? What does that mean to you? You cannot recall? No, I remember going over there. Kind of... Anybody want to help them? Anybody think they know what stand or Miss, Miss uh, Davenport probably, probably knows? knows. <laughs> Miss Davenport, yeah, you probably know, huh? Well, is it create? Yeah. Close. It's to standardize. Okay. Standardize. 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 Oh, okay. So the key thing, whenever you see promulgated, they just love to use fancy words, as always, but it's to standardize. Something that's going to be over and over. So that that uh, form they put up there on the screen a minute ago, that's a promulgated form, yep. which means it's standardized. It means every single transaction is going to use that type of form if it's a residential form. It's just a fancy word for standardized. Yep. Okay. Uh, and the committee is composed of six licensed real estate brokers in texas six lawyers from texas and one public member um, of the public why do you think we need one public does anybody know one public member to keep it neutral, keep it neutral exactly mm -hmm. neutral um, party in there too um you will need to know what each committee is comprised of. There's several committees, more coming up later. Um, but you'll need to know the, the amount of numbers that make up the committee and which parts they are, like licensed real estate brokers, lawyers, and so on. Uh, and they serve a staggered six-year term. So they have to be, like, kind of, like, voted into, I guess? Not so much voted, but approved. So I'll put you a little secret here. So those that are coming as real estate brokers, those are going to be given basically appointment by TREC. The lawyers are going to come from the state bar, the president of the state bar. And the one public member is come from the governor. And they have to be approved and everything before they can sit on there. And another reason the public member is there is because of the fact is they also want to bring in, you know, when you get a bunch of lawyers in the room, what happens? Oh, you don't you want get a that. bunch of legal terminology that nobody can understand, you know? Same thing with brokers. You get a bunch of brokers in the room, we know what we're talking about, but nobody else does. So they bring in that one public member to kind of dumb it down per se, quote unquote, so that average people understand the terms if that makes sense. Because you don't want to get a very technical contract and it's over people's heads. You want them to be able to kind of understand. All right, go ahead. All right. The use of promulgated forms. Uh, you must use the most current version because they love to change contracts. Wow. 
while he's doing that, so one of the things is, is that it said earlier that you have to utilize the most current contract. Right. And, and now the, hit that little edge, Stefan, right there. There you go. The date right here. Blow that. Sure. Hit the control button and scroll in, Aiden, so that they can kind of see that a little bit better. There you go. Scroll up a little bit. There you scroll up. See that little date right there, that tiny little date in the right hand corner of that contract? That is the date that it was promulgated. Okay. So what happens? What's that date say, Wyatt? 11 10 2020. So can I use a contract that was 9 16 2018? Yeah. No, because what has happened? That form is promulgated. Since that form is promulgated, I have to use the most recent form. If I use an outdated form, I am not in compliance with TREC, and I can be grounds for suspension. Yes, ma'am. Do you get notified whenever they created a form? Yes, yes ma'am. And your broker it. should actually have training classes yeah. for that. We so, actually just had to do one. Yep, we week. just did it with Bill last just week. last week. We had because they changed yep. some stuff on the contract. Now, I will tell you to answer your question further. <clears throat> Depending on where you go and the size of your broker, smaller ones, of course, are going to be more hands on. Bigger ones, they don't always, they'll send an email like a, hey, just FYI update. A lot of times it'll update your system. And if you didn't catch the email, you'll be filling out a contract and being like, I don't remember that there. Where did that come from? What's this? Mm -hmm. And then that's how you kind of know because the system will automatically update. But if you didn't catch that email, if you're like me and get a million emails a day, you may miss one and then sit down and start typing and be like, where did that come where in? Did it come the and then it's because you'll notice on here, and Miss Davenport, from the last time we talked, mm -hmm. the old contract there was an options period in the last classes. Mm -hmm. This new form, the option is gone. It's now been changed. Yeah. So they're changing the contract. So y'all are coming in at a perfect time because you're gonna get the updated contract. But the previous classes, we were talking off that because this didn't go into place till April first. Yeah, it's, it's so just it just went, went into con or into play, literally just a few days ago. Yeah. Yes, does that make sense? So you're getting the most up to date information now. Yeah, just so just gotta make sure. Yep, yeah. the dates are right. Um, can you so there's no longer an options period. There is, Miss Sheldon. They just moved it. You know how down when we filled yours out, it was down at the bottom, or like on the second, or last, second to last page. It's now, I believe, in paragraph four is where they changed it, and uh, it's still there. It's just not easily found. You actually have to go through it and find it. Yeah, they have that whole thing with the leases there too. Yeah, see, well, four is leases, and we'll be going through that in contract forms. Contract forms but uh, but yeah, they did change all of the stuff, Michelle, and everything. So see it right there. It's actually in five right there. You see where it says earnest money? That used to just say earnest money. Yeah. Now it's earnest money and termination option. So that's now where your option is going to currently be at. Okay. Make sense? All right. Um, yeah, go, go down to seven. Go back to the slides. Okay, so you must use the most current version of the form unless there are exceptions to the rule. Uh, unless a licensee functions solely as a principal, so if you're working for yourself, you don't need to do that. So if Wyatt wanted to work for himself and he just decided he wanted to draw his own forms, he can do that? He can do that. You don't okay. have to have use the forms if you're just doing it for yourself. Okay. Uh, federal, unless the federal federal government requires a different form, of course, the federal government, government you're going to have to use that form if they request it. Uh, or the principal has provided that requires the use of a other contract. That hasn't happened to me yet, but Justin says it does happen. It's best to speak with your broker about that before you make any decisions. My best one was they wrote it out on a napkin and they wanted the other party to sign it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that worked. It, it so it, well, well. Let's talk. Let's actually let's help them understand what's a principal because they're probably like the principal of the high school. That's probably what they're thinking. Principal is another name for a uh, client, okay. which could be a seller or a buyer. A seller or a buyer. Uh -huh. So in that situation, is say that Miss Sheldon 
if you're telling me so if Ms. Sheldon decides that she wants to write on a piece of paper this is my contract you have to use that if Ms. Sheldon gives that to you I do um, but I would still talk with your broker <laughs> that's right um, but yeah you would have to use that form if they told you to I'll tell you a real quick story I actually was sitting at a bar one time with a client my client wrote out said you go over you know how they have those little napkins a little they're not cheap napkins they're the bar he wrote on there he said wrote the number he said I will sell the property for and he wrote the price and he signed it he said you go get them to sign this and we have us a deal that technically is a contract it's in writing okay but do you think it's wise to take that napkin over to you and say here want to sign want to sign this offer the client's going to look at you you're going to be like I ain't signing that but if they do that, that you technically the best bet is is you always want to run to your broker, say, hey, this is what they're wanting to do, what should I do? And most of the time is the buyer is going to say, I'm not signing that. Or the seller will say, I'm not signing that. I want a legitimate contract. But you will sometimes run into people that have their own form that they've drafted up and they're like, this is what I want. Technically, they can do that. So if that ever happens, just run it by your broker. Yeah, just start your in your broker. It doesn't happen to me, but it does happen. Um, another exception to the rule: no contract has been. That's right. No contract. No contract has been promulgated for specific use, and licensee uses contract prepared by an attorney or broker lawyer committee. So if you get a contract prepared by an attorney and broker lawyer committee, um, you don't need to use the standardized forms because you have one written by an attorney. And they're probably pretty good at stuff. Uh, more uh, exceptions to the rule. Slide music. Yeah, there's a slide music. Yeah. Keep going, off your, <laughs> keep going off your deal. Pretty slim. Yeah. Okay. I didn't do that purposely, I promise you. It's just to know it's on, it doesn't happen. You sure you got that? No, I guess. You straight missing the slide. Okay. Just keep going off your slides. Um, okay, so those were all the exceptions. Okay. Uh, the seller's disclosure is addressed in paragraph 7B of the one to four family. B, seller's disclosure notice pursuant to 5.008 Texas property code. That just that code just deals with seller's disclosures. Uh, so either you're going to check the buyer has received notice. Hey, uh, you're moving the mouse. Don't even touch it. Okay, you don't. Yeah, be careful. So y'all can see it now. Everybody good online? Thumb up if you're good. Awesome. All right, keep going. Okay, so before I read that, who do you think actually signs the uh, seller's disclosure? Does anybody know? Who, who signs and fills in the seller's disclosure? Seller. Seller. Um, the agent will never fill out the form. Never ever do that. That's a huge liability. The seller has to fill out the um, the form. The seller's to quote the form. Um, Can they not quote? But kind of like answer questions. It's not guiding, but like. Answering questions while they're filling it out. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, you can you can run them through it if you like, but um, it's it's a, because the seller has lived in the home, they know what the home 
has and doesn't have and the problems it has. So um, if I were to fill it out, I don't know. I've never lived in the home. So I can't, I can't. But for example, if you have a Hispanic seller right. and um, you are helping them by translating, or yeah. is there one in Spanish? I don't think there's one in Spanish. That's so a then, very good question. Yeah. Very good question. A lot of the forms are not going to be in Spanish, and I'll tell you why. These in Texas, for some reason, all of our contracts are always in English, just because it's a state rule, I guess you could say. So all the forms are always going to be in English, but not all your clients are going to be able to speak English. So what has to happen is, is you would, in that particular situation, you would have to translate it. And you would have to break it down. And I've had people before that have went through the full contract and kind of just did a quick little blurb about each paragraph. So when they're going through the contract, they can also reference the sheet. But there is no Spanish to English or English to Spanish. It's all just English together. Yeah. So you would have to actually go through and explain kind of what it is. Um, and that's fine. You can do that. But you just can't tell them, hey, put something here or X here, do this or that. But you can certainly translate the form, explain the form, you just can't give quote unquote legal advice, if that makes sense. Understand? So, and one thing I wanted to interject real quick for everybody, y'all see that subsection 5.008 up there? I know Stephen was like, you know, that's another thing. You do need to know that. Okay, y'all are going to have to know that because on the text or on the exam, they're going to sometimes put subsection 5.008. So you will need to know that 5.008 is the seller's disclosure notice. Well, I can pull it up. Okay. If you want me to pull it no, up. no, don't. It's fine. We'll get to that when we get to principles and all of that stuff. So right. we don't need to worry about that. But I just want them to know, y'all will have to know actually that subsection because they will quote you on that. Um, okay. So back to the seller's disclosure. Uh, one is just the buyer has received notice. Two, buyer has not received the notice, but within blank days of the effective date of this contract, the seller shall deliver the notice to the buyer. If the buyer does not receive the notice, the buyer may terminate this contract at any time prior to the closing, and the earnest money will be refunded to the buyer. If seller delivers the notice, the buyer may terminate this contract for any reason within seven days after buyers receive the notice or prior to the closing, whichever first occurs, and the earnest money will be refunded to the buyer. So that's basically just saying, one, you got the notice, two, you're going to get the notice, and if you don't, you can walk from the contract. Not so much into that. Here, here's the thing. You can, but you're not letting them read that second, where was it here? They've changed it up. Okay, y'all see that that part underneath where it says on the third, or the, well, it says five, page 11. Second one, not the top one, but the second page there. You see where it says, if seller delivers the notice, the buyer may terminate the contract for any reason within seven days after the buyer receives it. So you are going to see here in a minute, Sheldon, you you there? Okay, Sheldon, so do you remember, Sheldon, we were just talking two minutes ago about options contract? Options contract is where, and I'll explain to everybody real quick what options is. So options contract is where you have a certain period of time to do your inspections. So say Sheldon puts a contract in on Wyatt's house and she puts a contract in, she asked for an option period of seven days. And she also, Wyatt, you did not give Sheldon the seller's disclosure, okay? So Wyatt has seven days, she uses her seven days and she finds out that in the inspection that there needs to be a, you know, a roofer needs to come out and look, okay? Well, her seven days is up today, we'd say. So most people, if, if you had not given the seller's disclosure, most people would have been in that situation, would have ended up said, you know, okay, let's don't worry about it, let's move on, because what happens? If you did not give them that seller's disclosure within the time, she has how many more days to make a decision to bag out? What's it say up there? Within seven more days. So Sheldon would have seven more days after. So if you give it to her tomorrow, how many days does she got? Seven days from tomorrow 
that she could still bag out. So it's like a free uh, option period. period. Do you see how that works? So sometimes that's what I say. And when we get to contract forms, we're going to go in detail and like dig all this stuff out. But it's little tips like that that you may end up, if they do not have a seller's disclosure, you may just want to not even have an option period in your offer because guess what happens? You already are going to get one for seven days from when you receive it. Do you kind of see how this works? So it's all about the wording and how you can work this out. But it's little things like that we're going to teach y'all in the class because that option period, if they use option, costs money. So if they don't have a seller's disclosure, why well, pay $100 for seven days when you already are going to get one for free? Yeah. You see kind of what I'm saying? And that makes you look like a super, super human star. to your clients, if you see what I'm saying, because you're saving the money. Okay? Makes sense? All right. Uh, so the seller's disclosure is a requirement um, of the Texas Property Code. Uh, there's a form called Trek Form OP-8-H. And that's a way to provide the disclosure, but that form uh, gives you the m minimal amount of information that you can give. Um, normally, just the seller's disclosure in general will give you way more information. The um, OPH, you said? Uh, OP dash H. Yeah. And it's the bare bone. It's, it's the, it's very the bare minimum that you can give to call, you know, to say you gave us the seller's disclosure. Sometimes you get a client that will say, I don't want to sign nothing and I'm not going to sign nothing. Well, yep. this may be your best bet that, because I'm just going to be honest, and I, I'm not scared to scare a client. I will tell a client straight up. I will tell them, if Miss Davenport, I walk to her and I say, Miss Davenport, I need you to fill out the seller's disclosure. And she said, I ain't signing nothing. I'm going to say, well, Miss Davenport, do you want a lawsuit? Yep. Because that's what's going to happen if you don't fill this out. <laughs> and I tell them. And if she says, I'm still not, then I'll say, you know what, Ms. Davenport, I'll give you this OPH form and you can complete it. It's a lot less. And in that situation, we just kind of do it that way. It's the minimum standard. Does that make sense? But sometimes you have to kind of stand your ground. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And that goes to like that bottom bullet there where he was just saying that sellers can limit the future oh, yeah. liability. That, that's what happens because if it's not filled out, say Sheldon, she just, she flipped her house. Sheldon knows everything now that's wrong with her house. If Sheldon decided tomorrow that she wants to sell her house, but she doesn't want to disclose anything, well, guess what happens? If somebody else purchases that house, guess what's going to happen? She's, she's going to end up, she don't get that seller's disclosure, she opens herself up to liability and she can be sued. And we're going to talk about DTPA later on. And what does that mean, Stephen? How many times, or how much can they sue for it if they're uh, sued under DTPA? You can get sued for up to three times the damages. It could be mental anguish or actual financial yep. uh, stuff. So it's three times. Let's say, let's say you get into trouble for, you know, 10000 So you're going to walk away with 30000 Yep. So it can get very expensive very quickly. All right. So I'm just closing here. And you've kind of gone through that no, already. We just did that when we went over the last. Let's see. Seven, uh, paragraph 7B3 is for sellers who do not have to provide the notice for law. Uh, the property code gives 11 exemptions to providing a, a seller's disclosure. <clears throat> uh, the first one is sale by court order. If the court's ordering you to sell the house, you're not going to need a seller's disclosure. Um, if you can lose a foreclosure, your house is getting foreclosed upon. Right now, you're going to sign it if, if they gave you one. Well, let's think about this. And while he's going through these, think about this. Ms. Davenport, if they sell that property, say they sell my house through a court order, did that judge ever live in my house? No. Mr. Wyatt. If they are foreclosing on my house, did the bank ever live in my house? No. So in this situation, what it what occurs? They don't have they can't do a seller's disclosure. They can't, they don't know it, and so if they fill something out, then they are taking on liability that they don't have, that they don't want to have. So that makes sense. So like a new home, Wyatt. Let's talk about that third one there. New home sales. Who's lived in that home? 
So who's going to tell you what's wrong with the home? No one. You kind of see how these are going. So as he's breaking this down to y'all, what's happening? It's in and up. Now that last one. Yeah, what do you think about that? That was the Oh, let's see what she said. Go ahead. That would be like a divorce, and they're splitting the assets. So uh -huh. in order for somebody, like for the wife to stay with the house, uh -huh. then in, in the contract in the husband's name, uh -huh. she knows what's wrong with the house. Exactly. So she's just basically transferring the deal. Exactly. Because she already lived there. She knows it. She knows it. She's been there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in that situation, that y'all see kind of, I want that rhythm in that when you're thinking this, and he's talking about them. Think about, oh, well, yeah, the bank's never lived there. The judge never has lived there. It's a new home, so nobody's lived there. The spouses, they, of course, live there, but they both knew it. That's the kind of mentality I want y'all to be in as, you're, as he's going through these. Go ahead and hit the next one there. All right, go ahead, Seth. Uh, that more extensions, uh, sale of real property where the sale or where the value of the dwelling does not exceed 5% of the value of the property. So a pretty much destroyed home. Is less for than the land, correct? Well, and also in that situation is if you're going to end up having real property, if the dwelling itself is actually so old, sometimes you'll have properties that are dilapidated and they're just kind of almost fallen in or condemned. In those situations, if the real estate, the real the land itself ends up has more value than what the value of the property itself is. You don't have to have a seller's disclosure because it's probably condemned, which means you don't need to be in the property at all. And I can tell you, I've shown some of them, and they are nightmares. <laughs> yes, I've shown some. And a client, one of my clients, was like, "Let's go inside," and I'm like, "No, no, 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 no. not going inside that place." So. <laughs> Uh, sale from government agencies, sell to or from government agencies. They're not going to need disclosure either because they know the government ain't living there. No. Um, sell by a trustee in a bankruptcy. That's an interesting one as well. What's a bankruptcy? Uh, you go bankrupt, you lose all your money. That's right. Did that trustee ever live in that house? Nope. There you go. The trustee doesn't know what to do. You see, when you're taking these tests, ask yourself, when you're reading through the hypotheticals, ask yourself this question. Say, did this person ever live in this property? Did that, did that trustee ever live there? No. Did that, you know, uh, government agency, did it live there? No. If they didn't, then guess what? There is no seller's disclosure that is needed. Okay, but what about the sale of just land? Well, does anybody... Go ahead. Let's let's ask somebody. What do you need a seller's disclosure for just land? Anybody? I want to say no, but I have a funny experience. Yes, no. because of the the flood zone. Okay. So we're gonna know yes. Uh -huh. you, you, sure you, uh, you sure you don't sell real estate? <laughs> <laughs> You say, no, I've just been. What do you like, say? You work. <laughs> <laughs> not like a legal company, but I've actually been interested in buying property. Yeah. So that's why I've like tried to. Been looking and thinking, right? Yeah, looking uh -huh. at everything. Uh -huh. Those flood zones will get you. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. We're like, you just go zoom right through this, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that is a good question. Yeah. And uh, to be honest, yeah, yeah. Well, go ahead. You're gonna say something. Go ahead. But it has nothing to do with this. It has to do with the previous one that we had talked about, the spouse to spouse. Uh -huh. So mm -hmm. say somebody is renting the house. Okay. And they've lived there for a good four or five years. Okay. And let me ask you this question: Has mm -hmm. the owner of the property lived in the house at all? To your hypothetical. Um. Yes. Okay. Well, yeah. So they lived in the house and then decided to rent the house. Okay. And then so. The tenant that is renting the house decides they want to buy the house off of the, the owner. Uh -huh. Would they need that disclosure? Yes, they would. They do have to have the disclosure because they have lived in the house. Now, had the owner never lived in the house, mm -hmm. different story. Yeah. Different story. But then they still would put a seller's disclosure, but it would be the basic seller's disclosure, not the detailed. You see what I'm saying? Because they don't know all the detail. But they still do have a duty to complete a seller's disclosure. Makes sense? Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to be honest, just to be across the board, 
I personally always require my people to have a seller's disclosure, even if it's raw land, simply because of the fact is I would rather us give it to them and nothing be on it. Because when they're going through that seller's disclosure, something might click and be like, oh, yeah, we are in a floodplain. Or, oh, yeah, this happened. I would rather give you a blank one that says there's nothing than miss something material, which we'll talk about, and then end up getting them sued. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm, I'm a very much documentation person. I like to have everything together. I want it together. I want everybody to see it so that everybody's on the same page. And he'll talk about that kind of as he goes on, but you always just want to kind of be safe. And if you're not sure, do what these guys and gals do that I have. They come into my office, what do you think? I don't know, I have a lawyer. I'll call my attorney and say, what do you think? Yeah. And most of the time, they'll say, just disclose it. If it's not gonna be in the seller's disclosure, at least put it in an email so the other party knows. Somewhere in writing. Somewhere in writing, exactly. So you, you will and will not need the seller's disclosure for land. Right. That's correct. It just depends. It depends. And it depends on the brokerage you're with. Just because everybody's in here, everybody goes to different brokerages, and that's fine. I don't mind. But I always say, follow what your broker's policy is. That's one of the key things. Always follow what your broker's policy is. Okay. Okay. Real estate REO sales. Uh, that's basically like a bank repossessed home. So you're not going to sell this for that one. <clears throat> um, or sale from co-owner to co-owner. They both own the property. They probably lived in it. They don't need to. Yeah, they might not have, but still, they're in the same business. They knew about it. Yeah, that's they, all that matters. Sell between divorcing spouses. That's what you were talking about earlier. Um, sell by will, executors, guardianships, or trust. Um, if it's in a will, just going straight to your getting it free anyways, right? So. Well, and again, did those people, whoever's the executor or guardian, who did they live in that house? Yeah, probably not. I mean, that's kind of what we're dealing with my grandmother right now. She passed away. Nobody's ever lived in that house. We don't know what's in that house. She didn't so, live in the house? No, she, well, she ended up in her last few years, she was living with my aunt, so she wasn't even in the house. Now, she, if was alive, she would have to fill it. But since she's passed and my aunt's now the executor or executrix, she has to, well, not have to complete the seller's disclosure because she's never lived. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Just like if I went, say, Miss Davenport, I ended up, I was going to go sell her house. I've never lived there. How, how can I fill out her form if I've never been there? Never been there. That's right. <laughs> All right, the Deceptive Trade Practices Act. What's the, the little acronym? The acronym for that will be DTPA, and they'll likely use that on the test as well. Um, yeah. All right, so the Deceptive Trade, Trade Practice Act, it applies to a lot of things, not just real estate. It can go, you know, it could be any business, really. Um, it's if any, any false, misleading, or deceptive act or a licensee taking advantage of a consumer's lack of knowledge, ability, experience, or capacity to the grossly unfair degree. Um, it's, it's there to protect the public because if, let's say, we were talking about the three times damages, that's that's the Deceptive Trade Practice Act. If you, if you can prove that deceptive trade was done, then uh, you could sue for uh, three times damages. Now, one thing I want you to focus on real quick. Do you see up there where it talks about protects public from and then boom, boom, there's two little dashes there. Okay. Y'all are going to have to be, you're going to have to treat this like it's a law of class because like, it is law of contracts. You have to understand that when they are looking at cases and when you're taking questions, you got to give weight to each one of those words. So, of course, any is not a big deal, or is not a big deal, but things like false, misleading, deceptive, those are going to be your big words there. So, when you're reading through a, a hypothetical, 
and you see that the real estate agent is misleading or taking advantage of the individual, then there is, and this is a key thing, there is potential DTPA. Does that make sense? Don't always assume it's going to be DTPA, but there's potential that there could be a DTPA case. Does that make sense? So when you're going through these, make certain that, because when I'm normally in teaching this, I always say, they say, well, listen, don't give me a hypothetical. A student will give me a hypothetical. And my answer 99% of the time is, well, it depends. Because the fact of the matter is, is you've got to also go down here to the bottom, the second one, and you got to see what about the consumer's knowledge, their ability, their experience, or their grossly unfair degree, such as a unconscionable act. So just because you may see two elements does not mean that you may have all of them. And as we get to contracts and get into the contract itself, you'll notice that you have to have all the elements to make up a DTPA case. Y'all see how this works. So when you're going through these, take them step by step, take them in stride. Don't rush to it. Just kind of go through it. Because I'll have people coming in my office or they'll call me and be like, hey, this happened, blah, 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 it's a DTPA. And I'm like, well, I need more facts. Just because you assume it doesn't always mean that it's there, okay? Sometimes an innocent mistake may be mis misleading, but not actually be deceptive, or may not actually be that they're taking advantage. We all see how I'm saying that, okay? So that's when you're reading through these, especially when they're talking about acts, focus on those words, if that makes sense, okay? It's to protect the public not the company, the broker, or the licensee, it's for the public. So real quick, Aiden, you got quiet over there. What's an unconscionable act? Oh, man. Come on now. What's conscience mean? I mean, you know what's going on. Okay. So if conscience means, have you ever heard, do you have a conscience? Okay. All right, what's, what's that mean, Ms. Davenport? Do you, what, do you have a conscience? What's that mean to you? What does that mean? Worried about something. Basically, in a way that you're ending up, when I'm saying do you have a conscience, if you don't have a conscience, you think that person's what? Heartless, mean, crude, okay? Mean, all those things, okay? So what would unconscionable mean? They did something that really, quote, unquote, shocked the court. Do you see what I'm saying? So a unconscionable act is an act that actually shocks me. So say that you're before me and I'm a judge and I find out that you were representing Miss Davenport, but you ended up because you wanted to sell, you did not tell her that there was termites and you told Steph and the inspector, Shh, don't remove that so that we can make the sale go. What if I'm hearing this, do you think that would shock me? Yeah, because whose interest are you putting in, in front of everybody else? Your own. You're not worried about your client. You're over here conspiring with Mr. Stefan up here. And so what's happening? You have shocked the court, which means, guess what? It's probably going to be a DTPA because you're misleading. You're giving false and deceptive information, and you're taking advantage of her. That's an unconscionable act. Y'all see how that works. So when we talk about conscience, think about that from that situation is, oh my God, that would shock me. That's kind of the situation. So you never want to go into it just like if you were representing Wyatt and you happen, didn't do an inspection, you happen to see some, some ants with wings on and you step on it to kill it. Okay, so he don't see it. Well, is that technically taking advantage of him? No. And if he told you that he didn't want an inspection, well, then who's the burden going on you or him? Him at that point. So now are you taking advantage? You stepped on a, an ant that had wings. We may or may not had an inspection. And if you told him to get one and he didn't, now the burden's back on him, not you. You kind of see how this, this works. So you got to look at the elements and the fact to really determine is this, what, is this going to be part of DTPA or is it not going to be part of DTPA? Does that make sense? Everybody good? Go for it. I think that's actually, yeah, that's all right. 
That's the last slide? The last slide for the evening. All right, now ask everybody if they have questions. Does anybody have any questions online as well? Well, start with you in class first, and then you go to your online. Are there any books? Are there any books in this book? I think there's going to be a textbook on the online. Okay. Well, double, I will double check, and if I've got one, I will get it printed off and have it for you for next class. How okay, that? all right, no We'll get that taken care of. Ms. Davenport, so remember that, guys. Ms. Davenport, we need to double check. Okay. Uh, Ms. Uh, Mr. White, any questions? Oh, good. You good? Good, sir. Good. Now, um, how are we going to get quiz? Do we homework? Yep. There, there is, how about you go back there and, and pull it up and let her see as well as everybody else. Go through it. Show her how it works. So how long is this class, Justin? Ma'am? How long is this class? This one's two weeks. Oh, okay. Uh, so we will get through this every two weeks. We'll complete a class. Oh, okay. And when's the final class? So you were in, let's see here. No, no, I'm not behind. I'll have to pull your stuff. Okay. I'll, I'll look and I'll let you know. Okay. Um, for mine, do you have um, a like something that you can pull up since I took one of them, or actually I guess two of them at Blend, the principles at Blend, and then the rest with you? Yes, do you have like a place that you can pull all that up? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I can go through and I can get everything and see where y'all are at and what y'all are still needing and go from there. I can do that work on that tomorrow for you. So Justin can give you access to this. You. You're welcome. Uh, yes, real quick. Those of you that do not have access to this, shoot me an email. Yes, please I, shoot us I, an email. I might have not gotten everybody. I was trying to go through and get that done before class, and I didn't have a chance. So if you have not got access to this, shoot me an email. I will get you access. Okay. Will you do the same link as the last class? Yeah. What, yeah. Yes, the same email, admin at captechinstitute.com. Yep. Um, he's going to give you access to this here, and you'll have classwork here. We have it in the tab. Um, yep, there's the book up there. I saw it. Yeah, textbook, okay. textbook is on this one. Yep. Uh, Learning objectives, course materials. This is where you can you're see. going way too fast. Slow down. Sorry. Slow down. There you go. Uh, we got learning objectives, course materials, and there's Justin's lecture. He's already recorded. You can watch those back as well. Um, and then you're going to have a discussion question and a content quiz, about 20 questions for each one. Okay, you got it all over the place for me. For the, sorry, for the discussion question, are we not going to go over them in class like we did previously? So what we will end up doing, let me, let's start up here, Shelton, and then I'm going to come to your question here in just a second. How's that sound? Sound good? All right. Okay, so up at the top, you got your course orientation. That's going to be your orientation, your syllabus, information about me, and then, of course, we have our helpful websites in regards to Trek. Uh, it looks like they changed again, so I'm going to get that changed again. This is NAR's website and Texas Realtors, okay? So each one of these right here, as you see them, they're kind of broke down. This right here used to be the contracts. I will get that fixed and have that working too. But these will be the sites that you will need to be familiar with, okay? Now, right here is your textbook. If you click right here, your textbook will pop up, all right? You can print it, you can bind it, you can read it on your tablet, your phone, whatever you want, but there is your textbook, okay? Now, there is an optional book. I will tell you why I put this book up here. When I worked years ago, I used to end up, Sheldon, you probably heard this, and Wyatt, you probably heard of this. I used to work at JCPenney's when I was first starting out. My mom and daddy said, told me, Justin, go to school, go to college. I didn't know nothing. I'm going to be honest. I was the first generation out of my family that went to college, first one. And my mom and dad told me, said, you need to go, and then you need to get a job. And guess what? I went and got a job at J.C. Penney's, worked, made $5.15 an hour, a lot of money back then, okay, $5.15. And I ended up, I thought I was rich when I walked away, you know, 500 to $800 a month. I was rich, okay? But uh, I ended up, y'all, I uh, 
one day a friend, a good friend of mine, had gave me that book and said, Justin, I want you to read Think and Grow Rich. And I was like, I don't like reading. I'm a college kid that wants to go party at Northgate all the time. I don't want to go reading. And he was like, no, I want you to read that book. And I said, okay. And I read that book. And after I read that book, it put me in a completely different mindset. Because your parents teach you to do what? Go to school, get a job, and work for somebody. Right? Mm -hmm. This book don't teach you that. This book teaches you how to basically take your time because your time's valuable. And one thing that most of you have is what? You've got a lot of time. You've got a lot of time and some of you little money. So you got a lot of time, little money. But guess what? If you exchange that time to make money, what eventually happens? The time is going to go down, but the money is going to go up because you're working. And y'all, I started my first business when I started going to Blinn. I think I was probably 19 or 20. And guess what I did? I went around and I just asked anybody I could, can I come wash your car for you? I'll charge you $20 to wash your car. And I go wash your car. It wasn't anything fancy, but I washed your car. And if you want me to come pick it up, I charge you five more dollars. So I come pick your car up, go wash it, and bring it back to you for 25 bucks. Guess what happened? Everybody wanted me to go wash the cars. So I ended up, I pushed up my price a little bit. Started getting less customers, but guess what? I got repeat. The people that were weekly wanting me to wash their cars. And I eventually got rid of that business, took my money, and I turned around and I started another business. And eventually I just built myself to where I'm at today, where now I have 20 agents all over the state. We did $15 million in sales last year. Okay. We ended up my first year in business, we were already in the top 100 in Bryan College Station for brokerages. And so what I tell everybody is, is this, is if you want a different mindset, read this book. You go to school, that's great. I'm, I'm proud, go to school, that's good. But also learn about how to think. It teaches you differently. It is a hard read in the beginning, but if you get it going, it'll make sense. That's why I always put that book there. Yes, ma'am. I'm three fourths uh, way through with it. I was actually, a fourth of the way through with it when you showed me this. So I just continued to. What do you think about it? I love it. Um, it's I, right now I'm in the part where they're talking about um, anything that you desire, you have to actually like kind of like law of attraction, that's go right. for it. That's right. And that's the only way you're actually going to be able to become successful is if you actually um, take that idea and take that first step instead of just having that idea and just letting it sit there. That's great. So you've got to take that first step. You have to. Let me tell you, I'll give you a real quick little thing. My mother works for me. One of the key things my mom has always worked for yeah, anyway, me. She finished it. She uh, finished the program. Really? She finished the program. She took her test? She's not taking her test oh, yet, okay. but she finished. Wow. But let me tell you, my mother always said, I can't go back to school because I'm too old. <laughs> That's what she said. I'm too old. I can't go back to school. And then she was in class. And we forced her in class. And the guys and gals up here said, you're going to be here. Even Miss Davenport supported her. So get your butt in here. She was here. She finished. She's about to take her test and she's going to get her license. But I tell everybody this, you're never too old. And people that tell me they're quote unquote dumb, too dumb, there is no too dumb. Because let me tell you something. This guy right here, had you met him the first time I ever met him in class? He was the quiet one in the back of the room that wouldn't even talk. Mm -hmm. He was scared. Okay? He was freaked out. And I told him one day, I said, it doesn't matter what people think because guess what? Here's the thing. You just be happy with who you are. You do the best you can. And now this boy sitting right here in front of y'all getting prepared to start teaching this because it's a passion that he has. I'm now trying. he's nervous. I'm not gonna lie, he's nervous. <laughs> Just like Aiden is back there. But I'll tell well, you. Right. Yeah. No, that's right. We're yeah. here to work together. And that's what we're here for. So but yes, it is a very good book. Let me also add I found it on audio. Yes, ma'am. On YouTube. Uh oh. For free. Oh for free. Where? 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 Where?
I just want to put this out there. When I met you, I had just broken up with my girlfriend for two years. So I was a mess, man. Yeah. I Actually, was one day, there was one day, and why I can kind of tell y'all, just FYI, how I am. I When I'm talking to my students, I can tell if something's wrong. And I'm a type of person that if Wyatt has a problem, I will ask everybody else, well, great day, and I'll shut that door and I'll have a talk. Because yeah, that's what he did with me. That's what happens. I will have a talk with you. Because I know everybody has potential. Because if this boy here, and I want to tell y'all something, this guy you see sitting here, I used to be called trailer trash because guess what? My mom and dad raised me in a trailer. They call me trailer trash. If I can do it, any of y'all can do it. There's no excuse. Y'all understand, okay? And that's what I give 110% to y'all because I want y'all to know this stuff so y'all get your license and you start making money and you have a change of life. Because let me tell you, you made yourself. How much How much did you make after splits with me? How much money did you make on your first sale? Um, it was almost 7000 well, high five. Uh -huh. $7,000. Now, Mr. Wyatt, how long is your job would it take for you to make $7,000? A couple of months. A couple of months. couple of months. You yeah, see what I, I'm saying? I, 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 my last job, I put it out. It was like the whole time that I was working on my last job. It was like eight months. I would have made the equivalent. I would have made half, yeah, half of that. It's one sale. Fourth of the year? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, it pays off. You gotta work for it. Oh yeah. yeah. Gotta work for it. So, but yes. So I'm got. I got off tangent. I'm sorry, Sheldon. I'm sorry. He I got off that. tangent. I get off tangent <laughs> very quickly. But coming back here. So you're. If you look up here, you'll see right here on the side. This is just kind of like a table of contents. So if you're just signed in, it's of course going to default you up here to the top. So if, as we go through the chapters, you can pick them. Now, of course, we're hitting chapter one here. And when you hit our unit or chapter one, you'll see the, the learning objectives, okay? And then what you'll notice under the next one is the course materials. So the PowerPoint that we just went over is gonna be right here. If you like it in outline view, some people don't like PowerPoint, they want it in outline view. You can print it off here. So I got it in both, okay? The lecture that I have is here from when I, uh, when I taught it. And the one tonight, when we get it all finished and uploaded, it'll be here. So we will have them kind of put them together. Now, Miss uh, Sheldon's asking, she's asking about this part, okay, in regards to are we going to go through the discussions? Are there discussions and all? There are discussions. There are two discussion questions here. The first says, what is the Deceptive Practices Act or Tra Deceptive Trade Practices Act and how does it apply to real estate agents? And the second one is when does the seller have to provide the disclosure, okay? What I want for everybody to do is you're going to respond. So when you go in here, you're gonna answer these two right here. You're gonna answer them, you're gonna submit them. And after you submit them, you will see the other ones that will pop up. I want you to peer respond to each one of these, kind of just going through. It's not gonna be extremely detailed, it does not have to be a book, just kind of a maybe a couple of sentences, one or two sentences, that's fine with me, just showing. Then what we will do on the next class, Stefan, so tomorrow when we come in, Stefan will come in and he will talk about these two. Okay, you'll get your opinions on them. Then right down here, you will see there is a quiz. When you click on the quiz, you get one attempt to take the quiz. So I recommend that you read your book, take your quiz. When you hit on it, it'll take you to another page. And then what will happen is make sure you're signed in up here, okay, to whatever account, and then you'll answer your questions, okay? Now, everybody asks, why in the world do you give me so many questions? <laughs> oh, 20, man. <laughs> well, no, I, ask, I get that question. Why do you ask so many questions? Here's the reason. Your exam, guess what, is going to be on the computer. And the more questions you go through, what's that mean? The more prepared you're going to do what? They look you're going to be similar ready. too. They are very similar. Not, not the same, but similar. similar. So the key thing is, the more you test, when you go take your exam, guess what happens? 
you're prepared. You see what I'm saying? How long was the exam? The exam, well, go ahead. You did three hours to do it. Um, there's a national and a state portion. The national is going to be the long one. That one's about 80 questions. And then the state one is 45 questions, I believe. And the state one goes into a little more detail on some things. Uh, that's the one that gave me a little trouble. Well, there is math. There is math. Not, but don't not, freak out. Not much. Don't freak out. Oh, there is math. <laughs> not very much. Uh, okay, real quick for those of you don't online, run. real quick. Uh, Sheldon, Corey, Leticia, uh, and Giovanni, how are y'all on math? If you're good, put thumbs up. Bad, put thumbs down. So so bad. So so bad. Okay. All right. Say no. Nope. <laughs> Everybody's kind of like this. Everybody's kind of thumbs right. down. Okay. Let me tell y'all. This is how hard it is. You ready? Can you do two plus two? That's about how difficult it is. All right. It's, it's very it's, easy. Or, or can you convert a, uh, a a fraction to a decimal and vice versa? That's pretty much how difficult it is. You can fail all the questions that are math related on the test yes. and still pass. Oh, well, yes. How many of them do you know? <laughs> I think I got six, maybe. Then, well, the test, the, the math is broken down to about five questions that are actually great. So out of the test, they may give you 10, but of those 10, only five are going to be great. So you get five questions, and of those five, now you're not going to know which five, but you get five, and if you pass the five, you're good. And we actually have an entire class, an entire day, that we're actually in principle going to go through just nothing but math. Okay. And all it is is adding, subtracting, putting things to decimals and stuff like that. So it's very, very basic math. So don't stress over that. It's not algebra. So yes. we're good there. We don't need letters. Anyway. Yeah. We're not doing algebra or geometry or any of that so kind of stuff. We don't need letters. If, if, we, if it's something technical, we call Sheldon and she'll take care of you. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like that look. <laughs> so, but yes, does that, does that kind of answer your question? Sheldon, does that answer your question, ma'am? You're good? All right, perfect. Anybody else have questions? That's what we're here for. Anybody have questions? So, the quiz is due tonight? No. So, that's an even better question. I do not, We so my go for the next two weeks is getting the information in your head. I don't care about quizzes. I don't care about discussion. I don't. I want to get the information in your hands, and I want to. I want to make sure you understand. That's my go. That's his go. That's his go. Let's get this in your mind. You will have so first two weeks. We're gonna go through this. The following week, you have an entire week to get all your assignments done for the past class. So, we will do two weeks. This is what worked in our previous one. Everybody loved it. So we're gonna do two weeks of lecture. Don't stress over assignments. You can go ahead and get ahead, by all means, go for it. But I would rather you focus and understand the material and go back and do the stuff than ending up stressing every night trying to do it. Because I know some of y'all are in classes and have jobs and all that. So I give you technically a whole three weeks to lecture in a week to do your assignments. Does that make sense? So you can get all your assignments and all that done the following week. That makes sense. How much relief was that? Was that good, Shell? You feel good about that? Got a, got a week there? That was great. The first week I kept up and I was doing good. The second week I had like three like A&M exams. Oh, God. And so I was thankful for the third. <laughs> well, well, Giovanni said he'll take your test for you. So we're good here. Well, that's perfect. <laughs> if we learn 4.0, then, then we can be happy. <laughs> so what you got? I think it's, it's like the oh, okay, Seven does have one thing he does need to let everybody know because we got to stay in compliance with Tret. Yeah, to keep us in compliance, please make sure you're in class either on Zoom, on Zoom or actually in class. If you miss a class, uh, you will not get credit for that class. Yes, you so. have. We have to buy Trek rules. This is not Justin rules and or Stefan or anything. Trek requires that you have to be in every class, so you have to be here. So here's my thing, that's what Zoom is great about, is say, God forbid, Wyatt, you're sick and you don't feel well. I don't want you coming to class if you're sick, period. I want you to stay home. Stay home, stay, get on Zoom, you're fine. If you're like McKenna, who just got like literally in the last seconds were to get in here real quick, in that situation, just let me know. Call me, call Stefan, call one of us, email us. Just let us know what's going on. You work with us, we work with you. 
but I don't want you coming up here soon. That's my key thing. But all you got to do, get on Zoom, and I'll also tell you, say Miss Corey, say that you need to be driving and you're going to somewhere. I don't care if you put it on your phone and you're driving along. I'm good with that just so long I can see you're in class. Does that make sense? So we've had clients that have done that before that was like, I've got to go somewhere. And, and I'm going to be on the phone and I'm like, I don't care. As long as you're in class and you are, I see you, you're, you're here. In my, in my book, you're here. And if Trek says, hey, I need to see it, I have proof right here. Does that make sense to everybody? So, Mr. Grossman, do you have a card or something? So, I don't think we have any. Well, I think Mr. Grossman needs to type his information on this screen up here. And he needs sure. to end up, let me change this so that, Mr. Grossman, you can have... And everybody can see this online and they can write it down and everything. So let's load that up here. Just don't go to bars and like throw it out. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I told you that. No, we're good. I'm not throwing out. I'm just throwing out. Give his number out to everybody. <laughs> he does not know it's good. I, I actually, <laughs> actually, y'all, I got to tell y'all. I'm glad you go ahead and fight this. I got to tell him something. I actually had a student one time. He told me, thank oh, goodness it wasn't me. He had a professor that he did not like. This was years ago. I had a professor he did not like, and this professor failed him. He said, I did everything I could, and I still failed. So he took the professor's phone number, somehow got the phone number, put on Craigslist, free chickens, call this number. And they blew up his number asking for free chickens. So, so y'all all get on Craigslist or wherever and put free chickens and just put Mr. Grossman's information in there. So let's not, let's not do that. Can we not do that, Rich? <laughs> Give them your email too, just in case yes, they have questions. And he is old school. He has Yahoo. Uh, Mr. Aiton, I need you to come up here and put yours in too, because they're going to have all of them. They've got my information. So oh, yeah. I want everybody to, to put your stuff in there. Give me a call. Give him a call. We're here to help you. So Mr. Grossman will be there. Y'all can, like I said, write their numbers down, their email address. Uh, Aiden also is here. We will have, hopefully tomorrow, Travis will be here too. He will, yeah, he, he emailed and he had some stuff to take care of. And I said, we got it tonight. So he will be here tomorrow. Um, so y'all are going to have four people that y'all can call. Them. And so if you can't get me, you've got any of these guys. And if they can't help you, they will let me know and I will help you. So one way or another, you've got four people that are here to help y'all. Uh, and that's, like I said, it does not matter. I get people that message me at 2 in the morning. I may not respond right away, but but I will see it the first time I get up in the morning. I guarantee you. Yep. Okay. I'll probably be able to respond at 10 in the morning. Yeah, so. Aiden, Aiden probably yeah, will sometimes, respond at 2. I'll be honest too. Yeah, yeah. Aiden sometimes probably will there. respond, but I will not be up, I promise you, because I do, and I do want to let everybody know, so not only do I teach at Blinn, just kind of give y'all just a heads up, not only do I teach at Blinn, but I also teach for my own school here. Uh, I also run a real estate brokerage. Um, I also teach at another school, a law yeah. school out in Arizona, but I teach for them remotely. Oh. So on Tuesday, oh. Thursdays, uh, I will be skipping out a little early, about 6.30 or so, because I got to go get online to teach for that. So if something comes up or we're missing something, the guys are going to help you. Uh, but again, I'm going to try to be in as much. So on Tuesday, Thursdays, you'll see me kind of skip on out for a minute so I can hop into class. Uh, but again, no matter what, you got questions, say Mr. Grossman's teaching and he ends up, he's got a, he's not sure about something, he'll let me know and I will answer it the next class or y'all got a question, message me. Okay. If I don't know it right away, I'll get the information. Now I will tell you, at the end of this, y'all are all going to be critiquing this one. Okay. Oh, goodness. And y'all, and I want y'all to be serious with me and then tell me, you know, because one thing I've told him. Is I'm, I'm one of his worst critiques. I'm going to be the one that's constantly, as you see, checking in, making sure, because that's what makes him better. And that's the same thing when y'all end up, if y'all are like, hey, he's quiet or whatever. If you can't hear him or you can't understand, same thing for those of you online. Tell him, because he no. needs to know that stuff. No. Okay? Because that is what's going to make him better, and that's what's going to make him be able to mentor better as well. Oh, you're okay? not going to be quiet when I'm around. Hey, I love that. <laughs> I love that. I got a million questions. That's, That's good. good. I 
I'm telling you. That's good. <laughs> Miss Sheldon, my question, ma'am, are you good? You feel good? Everything's going well for you, ma'am? In terms of? Just school. How did class go tonight for you? Oh, great. London. Awesome. Miss Corey, you good? How'd you like your first night? It was good. Good. Did you get learn enough? I think so. Awesome. Do you feel feel confident? Um, looking at Google Classroom and seeing the assignments in front of me, I do feel a lot more confident. Good. I love to hear that. I'm glad. And of course, if you got any questions, you let us know. All right. Thank you. Anytime. Let's see. I just looked at that light. I'm blinded. Giovanni. Yes, sir. How you doing? How you feel? I'm so weak. Uh, I feel I feel excited, uh, ready for the to keep learning. Awesome, awesome. Don't y'all don't be quiet. Y'all need us. We're here, man. I appreciate you tonight. <laughs> yes, sir. Miss Coleman. Yes, um, I've enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the classes. Awesome. And if you need us, let us know. We're here. And, and Miss McKenna, how are you? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear y'all. How'd you like it, ma'am? I liked it a lot. Y'all did good. Awesome. I'm glad. Miss McKenna, by the way, is currently, she interns for us up here. So so you'll see her maybe off and on up here as well. So, but uh, I'm glad. I'm glad we got us a nice little group this time. I love these smaller groups. I don't like big groups. It's yeah, hard. I could have done like 40 so. I've, I've had guys and gals. The, the last class I've had, how many of y'all think we had in the previous one? We had about 20. No, no, we had uh, probably about 15. 15 or so? Yeah. We had a bigger class the last one, and Mr. Davenport remembered. We had a lot of people in here and a lot of people online. Yeah, so, online. Yeah. Yep. so we had a pretty big group last time, but I'm glad we got this smaller group because we can interact more and ask those questions. Ask those questions, please. Fire them off. Yes. So, but any questions for us uh, in person? Anybody? Y'all good? Anybody online, if you're good, put your thumb up for me real quick. Good, good, good. All right. All right. Well, then we're done tonight, and we will pick back up tomorrow, and we'll go from there. So I will see everybody tomorrow. Y'all have a good evening. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Yes, ma'am. Oh, thank you. I have a question for you outside of, like, it's not you want really. To call me? You want to call me? Okay. So a lot of things has ha have happened um, family-wise, but my mom just bought a house. Hey, how about, how about you call me? You got my no, phone. Okay, okay. All right, I'll see everybody later. So you'll hear you. Yeah, you'll hear you.